Hey everyone, welcome to our very first lecture on the world of William Faulkner. I'm really excited to do these screencasts for you and you're just going to have to be patient with me because I tried to do them all in one cut because I don't want to edit. So there might be some mistakes, be nice to me. Um, first we're going to talk a little bit about my expectations on these lectures. The objections, the objections, the objectives of all of these lectures really are to practice the skills of listening and note-taking. Um, when you go to college, you're gonna have reading that you need to do outside of class, but when you go to class, you're going to be talking about topics that, get, that kind of lead into that reading or maybe help support the ideas that are in that reading, um, but you're not necessarily going to be doing that reading in class. And so taking notes and listening and participating in class discussions, these are all ways that we make um, a text more alive. That is the goal of this unit. And so we are going to have many lectures that you will need to take notes on. Um, in fact, this is going to be your checkpoint one. It's going to be all of your notes from the lectures that we have. This specific lecture, we are going to talk about three major components of William Faulkner's work and focus a little bit in on As I Lay Dying in particular. So we're gonna talk about the American South as viewed through the fictional Yakna Patatha, that's right, county. We're gonna look at the modernist literary movement, which was inspired by the current events of the day that Faulkner was writing in. And then we're going to look at the stream of consciousness narrative style. Um, this is something that makes reading As I Lay Dying a little bit difficult, uh, but I'll give you some tips on how to be successful with that. Um, really quick before we get into our lecture, uh, just so you guys know, it's my expectation that you keep a running set of notes for this project. In fact, I have changed checkpoint one to just be your notes on all of our lectures. Um, you should also be keeping notes on discussions, but the reality is uh, with going online, all of our discussions are going to be accessible online, so you already have those notes. So I will only be checking for your lecture notes. Um, these notes are going to help you develop an idea for your paper. This is all going to help you get to the end uh, when you write your final paper for me. And the goal of this is to practice a more collegiate style of education so that you can practice with me and be an expert when you get into your college class next year. Because you're going to be graduating. Okay, so right now you need to decide what you're going to do. Um, you can take notes on the platform. You can just take them straight on Checkpoint One um, and take notes on your computer. You can take notes on a Google document and then transfer it over to the Checkpoint Leader if you want, or you can take notes on paper. And if you're gonna take notes on paper, I am gonna ask that you take a picture of them and that you upload them in the right place on Checkpoint One so that I can see the notes that you took. Um, you can choose all three. I would pause right now and I would make a choice and then come on back and I'm gonna keep moving on with this lecture. One thing really quick I am gonna say about taking notes on your computer, um, and this would be a little bit more pertinent if we were actually in class, but taking notes on your computer does open up the opportunity to get more distracted when you're in a typical class. So you can play solitaire, you can check your email, you can do all of these things that, um, take away your focus from what's happening in the class. There are a lot of professors that don't always let you use your computers because we don't always have the best self-control. Um, personally, I like to handwrite my notes. There's a lot of research that connects um, how your hand and your brain kind of help you learn. I'm a little bit of a tactile learner, so it could also have something to do with that. Um, but just FYI, good for you guys to know as you are going into your futures. So let's jump in to our lecture. Hopefully you've made your choice by now. All right, so William Cuthbert Faulkner was born in Mississippi in 1897. He was the eldest son of Murray and Maud Faulkner, and he grew up in the town of Oxford in Lafayette County. Faulkner was not a successful student and he did not even manage to graduate from high school, but this should not be seen as a reflection of his intelligence or skill. In his early years, Faulkner was fascinated by the stories told to him by his elders, specifically about the history of the South 
especially the legacy of the Civil War and of slavery, and also about his family in particular. They played a really significant role in the history of Lafayette County and in the state of Mississippi as a whole. So when Faulkner embarked on his career, he uh, first attempted a very unsuccessful attempt to join the United States Air Force during World War I. Uh, he then decided to move to writing. So starting with his third novel, which was called Flags in the Dust, Faulkner began to set most of his novels in a fictional version of Lafayette County, which he called Yakna Patafa, right? You guys are going to have to say that four times fast. Uh, this is one of the most unique qualities of Faulkner's bibliography, the fictional yet highly realistic world he created for his novels to take place in. So over the course of Faulkner's 14 novels and many, many, many more short stories set in Yakna Patafa, he creates a living, breathing world with reoccurring characters and places and families, all of whom Faulkner used to explore the issues that plagued his homeland in the American South. The Civil War, for example, and its long-term impact and ramifications on the old families of the South is explored through the Satoris family in Flags in the Dust and the Unvanquished. Race and the consequences of slavery are explored through the McCaslin family in Go Down Moses and the Supton family in Absalom, Abs Absalom and the enigmatic Joe Christmas in Light in August. Finally, the, so, uh, the question of social class and social mobility serve as the focus of several novels, whether we are looking at the fall of the once prestigious Compson family in The Sound and the Fury, which is one of my personal faves, or the rise of the once poor Snopes family as documented in Faulkner's late career Snopes trilogy. So As I Lay Dying was written in only six weeks and was published in 1930. It is a Yakna Patafa novel that follows the Bundrens. They are a family of farmers that live in extreme poverty in a part of Yakna Patafa called Frenchman's Bend. It's a rural community some 20 miles away from the county's main city, Jefferson. Based on his own statements, Faulkner seems to believe that As I Lay Dying was his best work. He calls it a tour de force and a masterpiece. The premise of the novel is basically this. Addie Bundren, who is the mother of the family, is dying, and her final wish is that her family returns her to the city of Jefferson, which is many miles away, in order that she be buried there. The novel addresses issues of social class, and it is one of Faulkner's only novels that focus on the extremely poor. What's interesting about this novel is that although it takes place within Yakna Batafa County, the Bundren family is unique only to this novel. They don't show up in other novels like the other characters do. Um, they have one passing men mention in one of his short stories, um, and none of the events that happen in this novel show up in any of the other novels. So As I Lay Dying is one of his self-contained stories about an isolated family set in a world that Faulkner otherwise took great pains to make interconnected. So that's pretty interesting. Perhaps uh, the decision to do this was due to another major literary movement of which Faulkner was a huge part. Um, Faulkner wrote largely during the time period that is most associated, most associated with modernism. This was a literary and artistic movement that rose out of response to the devastation and horrors of World War I and essentially stated that after World War I, the world no longer had meaning, or at least we could not look at meaning in the same way that we used to. Authors during this time period, including Faulkner, promoted ideas of individualism and experimentation in the hope of finding and creating new forms of meaning where the old ones had failed. We will see as we read As I Lay Dying, many of the characters struggling with very modernist ideas and conflicts. They struggle with the validity of religion and the meaning or the lack thereof of words and existence. Before you get reading, if you haven't already, 
uh, we should take a moment and talk about Faulkner's narrative style. Uh, this style is known as stream of consciousness, and this narrative style can be thought of as an attempt by the author to depict as authentically as possible the inner thoughts and feelings that pass through a character's mind. This is an attempt to actually replicate what a human thought process looks like in writing. It's very, very closely associated with the modernist movement, which makes a lot of sense. Do traditional ways of writing fiction, which depict characters' thoughts as highly organized and coherent, truly represent what our minds, what our brains actually look like? Or can we begin to reconstruct meaning by actually trying to put into writing the processes of our minds as messy and incoherent as they may be? So let's look at an example of traditional narration and compare it to stream of consciousness. So this is um, just an excerpt from Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Um, and she writes, I resisted all the way, a new thing for me and a circumstance which greatly strengthened the bad opinion Bessie and Miss Abbott were disposed to entertain of me. The fact is I was a trifle beside myself or rather out of myself. As the French would say, I was conscious that a moment's mutiny had already rendered me liable to strange penalties, and like any other slave, I felt resolved in my desperation to go all lengths. So, highly organized, complete thoughts and sentences. You know, this depicts the inner feelings of the character of Jane Eyre. It depicts her opinions about her circumstances in the novel. But is this how truly human beings think? Is this really how our brains work? So William Faulkner and his contemporaries like James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, they would all say no. Through their experimentation with the style of stream of consciousness, they attempted to replicate what they thought was a more authentic and true to way life of capturing someone's interior monologue. So here's an example from the first section of the novel. Uh, it's a chapter narrated by the character Jewel, and this is an excellent example of the form. It does have a little bit of a uh, light cussing in it, so stay with me. Um, but Jewel writes, well, technically he writes, but you can, okay, anyway. So he writes, it's because he stays out there, right under the window, hammering and sawing on that goddamn box where she's got to see him, where every breath she draws is full of his knocking and sawing, where she can see him saying, see, see what a good one I am making for you. I told him to go somewhere else. I said, good God, do you want to see her in it? It's like when he was a little boy and she says if he had some fertilizer, she would try to raise some flowers and he'd taken the bread pan and brought it back from the barn full of dung. So here we've got a very different experience than when we looked at Bronte's example. There's some things that are the same. Jewel is expressing his opinion, but his thoughts are scattered. They're disorganized. He jumps straight into this thought with no context and then connects ideas and memories and thoughts together in ways that make sense to him but seem nearly incoherent to us. Faulkner would likely argue that this, confusing and grammatically incorrect as it may be, is a more accurate rendition of what our thoughts would actually look like if we were to put them down on paper. I think there's a lot of power in that. You know, it means that we can rely on the characters themselves to explain to us what they are like and what's important to them, rather than relying on a narrator of some sort to do it for us. After all, if you think about it, the narrator actually interprets the character for you, providing this sort of filter through which you experience the character. Think of stream of consciousness as a narration, uh, sorry, think of stream of consciousness narration as an opportunity to experience the raw, unfiltered, unedited version of the character. You're really getting their, their true thoughts. Even though it's frustrating and confusing to read sometimes, you're getting exposed to what they're really thinking. So um, as you read the first section this week, 
I really encourage you to, um, there's two things that will help with um, stream of consciousness narration. One, use the reading guide that I have underneath checkpoint one and read the chapter summaries before you read so you kind of understand what's going on. And two, I actually find it really helpful to read this text out loud and to kind of, and this is really goofy, but I give the characters voices just because when they're talking and when you've got emotion behind it, all of a sudden you, you can kind of hear what they're trying to say. So those are two tips I have for you as you read this week. Uh, make sure you get your notes for this first lecture uploaded or put into checkpoint one. And I will look forward to talking with you guys in our discussion or hopefully seeing you in my office hours this week. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you later. Bye.